she ends up being on the floor legitimately paralyzed arms contorted and cannot move saying help me help me help me. and they're and they're saying they're saying this is normal this is just the energies of the sun and the earth. <laughs> if everything is all perfect and we have no adversity and no infirmity and no tribulation what are we yearning for satan tried to kill me many times and you know it's it drives me to my knees in tears all the time because he chose me. Zero percent of the people at these conferences have perfect emotional health and perfect psychological health. They are a wreck. They are a broken vessel. And they're going there and they're trying to fix this problem. And they're trying to fix this problem by altering their brain chemistry so that they feel better. And then they medicate and um, put a bandage over the symptoms of living in, in constant sin through meditation, through mindfulness, through training yourself to not listen to any voice or form that passes through your mind, even if it's the voice of God. Hey everybody, this is Mike with On Point Preparedness and I'm joined with Stephen Van Cars and Lee from Philia Ministries. We've got a really awesome session with you guys today. What we're gonna do is talk about Dr. Joe Dispenza is his name and he's one of the up and coming new age occultists. And he's doing a lot of road shows all across the world, including the United States bringing people into the new age with science. There was a subscriber of mine who I'm going to have on later on my show, and she's going to talk about her testimony, but she was a very high up trainer in his organization. And she saw lots of very dangerous things from a spiritual perspective. And she wanted us to come on and really expose what he's doing so that Christians don't fall for his antics and his tactics. So Stephen, he's uh, been a blogger in the New Age. Stephen, where, where were you in the ranking? You were pretty high, right? Um, I guess so. I had a uh, I had a website that was one of the largest online. Um, it was called Spirit Science and Metaphysics, and it was getting you know hundreds of thousands of views a day on it. And I used to be an author for the SpiritScience.net, which um, is the largest New Age website. So. Uh, I was involved in the New Age movement altogether for maybe five years, four years, five years, but I started teaching it for maybe two. Um, so that was my career. That was my full time. My full time thing was uh, ad revenue and, and New Age articles. And um, what I did while I was in the New Age movement, I did a lot of like um, new thoughts, uh, self help kind of stuff, but also. Um, writing on things like alternative science, uh, the relationships between uh, matter and human consciousness, you know, the mind and the external world. And I tried to give kind of an evidential foundation for new age beliefs and practices. And then I had an experience in the presence of the Lord and realized that I was deceived the entire time. And now I'm uh, blogging at a, a website, Reasons for Jesus, com which is an apologetic site and i'm exposing everything i thought was true now yeah, and your test your testimony was how i found you and that was really powerful so you've been saved like what four years maybe five no i've been saved uh two and a half two and a half yeah so it'll be three it'll be three at the end of the uh, of september of this year yeah yeah so, so it's good to have you on um and again you're going to draw on a lot of your testimony and your experiences in the new age and helping expose this individual. And we've got Lee from Philia Ministries. So Lee, you want to say hi to everyone? Maybe tell a little bit about how you got saved and how you came out of the new age? Sure. And I actually used to follow Steve. Yeah, Steve, Steve had a age. pretty big presence, <laughs> right? Big little side note. But uh, I was a new age practitioner. I had clients all over the world. Some of them I would uh, do phone sessions with. I was an energy quote unquote healer. Um, I was a Reiki master. I was a psychic. I was a medium. I was all of those, you know, things that, that you can probably think of. Um, I actually, I actually got saved when I was 13, fell very far away from the Lord. And I came back to the Lord in 2013. So I've been on a journey of sanctification since 2013. I actually started reading a Bible, <laughs> which I probably should have done a long time ago. But once I started reading the Bible, it was like, oh, hi, this is the truth. Um, but I had a really radical experience, too, where um, I started um, being tormented by the the spirit guides, the ones that I thought were spirit guides. I started being tormented by them, and I fell on my face 
um, at 3.30 in the morning in my kitchen before the Lord and, and wept and the presence of God came in the room and that was it. Never been the same since. So yeah, that's my little story. And what I love about both of your testimonies is, you know, we talk about this baptism by the Holy Spirit moment and you talk about the creator of our universe, you know, the, the all-powerful living God. And when he baptizes you by his spirit, it's not some inconspicuous event. It's powerful. It's life changing. Yeah. You're a new creation. And so a lot of the testimonies I've done on my site, and Lee, I know you do salvation subscriber testimonies. Um, people think that they're saved and then they go around, you know, through mm -hmm. their life leading a sinful life and just keep on doing what they're doing. And then later they have one of these experiences, you know, their God yes. moment where they're just blown away. Um, they're baptized by the Spirit. They have a, a new knowledge of things, and they just do a 180-degree uh, turn, and then they live their life for the Lord. So I'm very happy to have both of you on, and the reason I invited both of you on is just because of your testimonies, the fact that you both came out of the New Age, and when this subscriber reached out to me saying, I need to help expose this person, I didn't have enough background to do so. And so that's why we have power in our individual testimonies. Uh, they, they each impact people in different ways. So it's going to be a really great conversation. I'm really happy to have you both on board. And so we'll go ahead and get started with a short prayer. And then we'll go ahead and look into some topics uh, that our subs or my subscriber wanted us to look into regarding Dr. Joe Dispenza. So dear Father, thank you for delivering all of us from the world and adopting us as your children. I thank you so much that we are able to redirect ourselves so that we can sow seeds into your kingdom. Lord, I ask that we put ourselves and our words and our flesh to the side and that you can speak through us and that we have an amazing and fruitful conversation about this individual and the New Age movement so that Christians are not deceived into this man's teachings or the New Age teachings or even people that are lost, that they don't fall deeper into this occultism and the new age, but rather seek out your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into the first topic here. So I'm going to pull up my notes. All right. So one of the things that's interesting, and, and I didn't know this because I didn't come from the new age, but... In the New Age, there's a lot of spiritual figures, um, maybe like Deepak Chopra is one of them, where it's all about spirituality and it has a little bit of religious flavor to it. And when my subscriber was talking to me about Dr. Joe, she said that he's coming from maybe a slightly different perspective. You get the spiritual perspective over here and the people that uh, you know like that flavor of religion, but there's a whole other crowd that prefers more the science. And that's the only way they're going to get into spirituality. So Dr. Joe, he has these conferences all over the world. He even goes into corporations, and it's about a 1,000 people a pop in, in one of these conferences. And he lures people in with science. I think one of the books or one of the sessions he has is called Brain Neuroplasticity. And so it's occultism repackaged into you know current-day science. And I'll show you guys a couple pictures on the screen where he's literally taking blood samples from people. Uh, we're really not sure what types of tests that he's doing on them, but he's misleading people saying that these, these tests show that you know, you're becoming more awakened. You're opening up your pineal gland, which back in the ancient occult days is what was thought as your third eye. He has these very strange harnesses put on people's heads that are measuring brain waves. And so he's really luring in maybe people that were former atheists or people that are just really about the science and things, and then leading down this whole new age path to a type of false spirituality. So Stephen, do you want to maybe talk about, you know, when you were in the new age, how this sort of pulled people in, you know, people that were more focused on the science and then they fell down the slippery slope into you know, new age occultism. Yeah. Um, I think where the new age makes its money and where it really deceives people and, and, and brings people over to its uh, worldview, where it seems to be really convincing, at least on a, on a superficial level, is it will appeal to uh, new and upcoming scientific discoveries or scientific 
hypothesis, and then it will try to link them to uh, ancient wisdom teachings and say, and then they'll, you know, proudly boast, oh, finally, science is catching up to the things ancients have been talking about for thousands of years. But when you actually look at, at the studies, um, it has nothing to do with such wisdom. In order to make, in order to turn that science into these ancient mystery school teachings, you have to make a whole bunch of assumptions, um, ontological assumptions about the, the data that we're observing that are simply unjustified. So, for example, um, there's a relationship, there just simply is a relationship between consciousness, our individual minds, and uh, the external world. Uh, there's an experiment done by uh, I forget, Dr. Emoto or something with the water crystals that's been replicated by Dr. Uh, Dean Radan at the Noetic Institute, where um, when you're freezing water, the water crystals will form in a more coherent pattern when these crystals are being, you know, having prayers said over them or they're having like an intention of love and positive thoughts projected onto them. Um, you know, the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. So maybe it's the case that that's the way God built the universe. There's some mysterious relationship between our thoughts, our intentions, our words, and uh, the fabric of reality. But what they'll try and do is they will say, here's an example of a false assumption they'll draw. Okay, so my mind impacts somehow the world around me minimally, whether it's the double slit experiment or whether it's these experiments with water crystals or whether it's the experiments from Princeton University with random number generators that people would be familiar with. So what they'll do then is say, well, this must prove, therefore, that both, um, you know, whatever is making up the water crystals and whatever is making up individual co human consciousness must be part of the same substrata. It must be part of the same kind of field. And that's why our mind is able to impact the material is because they both must be part of an underlying unified field. And they'll call this the unified field of consciousness or, um, you know, the source field, or they'll call it uh, um, Brahman or something like that. First of all, that assumption does not follow that just because two things are related uh, uh, to one another can impact one another, that therefore they share the same ontology or the same rootedness or in being in the same nature, it does not follow. So that's that's a joke. That would not pass in any philosophy classroom. But what's worse is then they'll try and link that um, to spiritual traditions like that of, uh, of Jesus. And they'll say, so this field, this unified field, this is the intelligence of the cosmos. This is what Jesus referred to when he talked about the Father. When he says, yeah, greater things you shall do for I go unto my Father, what he's referring to by the Father is this field this intelligent, unified field of consciousness that has the property of, uh, of awareness. And they will say this field of universal awareness or universal consciousness is what Jesus was referring to when he said the Father. Jesus said the Father's a person. He said the Father's transcendent outside of time and space. He said the Father can speak to us. He said the Father is the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a monotheistic personal deity who revealed himself to one specific nation and here you have people like Deepak Chopra or David Wilcock or El Eckhart Tolle telling us that because there's a relationship between mind and matter, that therefore there's this universal field that all religious systems are about, that all ancient spiritual traditions from Christ to Krishna to Buddha, they're all talking about this same field, and they arrive at this field through this spooky relationship between mind and matter. And, and none of that follows. Absolutely none of that follows. Right. So here's how this ties into the occult. So they make a bunch of false philosophical and theological assumptions to get to this unified field of consciousness. And then they will do things like meditation or yoga or binaural beats or using uh, psychedelic drugs to bring us into a deeper relationship with this, uh, with this field. Um, a, a saying in a new age movement was God is a frequency. Tap into it. Um, and so it starts off with you know this you know spooky relationship between human consciousness and water crystals or plants there's this famous effect called the baxter effect where apparently uh plants respond as well just like water crystals do to positive intention and uh they will say that that proves some kind of unified field of consciousness which it doesn't and that this unified field of consciousness is what every religion was talking about it wasn't, and then they'll use occultic means to be in relationship with this field and reach more fundamental levels of consciousness. So it starts off with, you know, alternative science, science that might be hard to explain, 
maybe even pseudoscience, even worse quality science than what I mentioned. And then it ends off with people practicing, um, you know, <laughs> divination, witchcraft, and, and various occult practices to try and be in relationship with this field that they only believe exists because someone with no relevant credentials in any field of study made a false scientific assumption that would get them laughed out right. of the major university. Yeah, and, and specifically Dr. Joe Dispenza, he talks about brain neuroplasticity and has all these booths where they're doing quote unquote scientific tests. But my subscriber said he's nothing more than a chiropractor. He has no degrees. Um, he's just you know speaking out two sides of his mouth. He'll put in some factual things, but then just cover it with a whole bunch of falsehoods. Um, so yeah, you're, you're spot on. I actually got a question for both of you, um, just based on what you said and and the conference that I went to. I don't know if you saw my my last video. It was an interfaith festival in Cincinnati and uh, just blew me away. But um, the question I had for you both was, what pulled you in first? Was it that you had a background? So I think both of you were raised in Christian families, right? So Lee, you said you were, and Stephen, I think your your parents are Christian. So did you come into this from more the religious side into the new age, or did you get pulled in from the science, or was it maybe half and half, it was even? And then the second question is, once you got into the new age, since New Agers believe in this Unitarianism, that all gods or, or all religions and all spirituality and everything leads to the same thing, um, did you did you consider yourself still um, a self-practicing Christian, but you were still in the New Age, or did you just completely drop the idea of Jesus Christ? So I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe Lee, did you wanna you wanna start off? Sure. Um, well, actually, so. The family that I was raised in, we did go to a church. It was a very dry type of church. We did go to church, but there was a lot of philosophies mixed in. So we, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a Christian home. Like we had that as part of what we believed, but there was a lot of like, um, like Taoist philosophy in my house. And we, you know, we touched on some, a lot of uh, shamanism and, and things like that. So I just thought it was normal to have all of these philosophies and faith and it just all like apparently worked together so that was very normal for me mm -hmm. um and you know jesus was my favorite <laughs> but but I, I was i was used to that and that's why like when i say that um you know i was saved when i was 13 and i'm just being very honest i still wrestle with that because i was jesus was explained to me and i believed but you know we know that even the demons believe in, and tremble i i it, repentance was never explained to me so I didn't understand the fullness of that. And so I, anyway, I, I still wrestle with that. But what drew me in, I'm sorry, I have like, we live in the woods and I got gunshots going off and <laughs> dogs and gunshots. Okay. It's like a cannonball. Um, so, but I started um, experiencing Ill, uh, illness when I was around, actually right after that time when I, I either got saved or I didn't, I'm still not hundred percent sure. But I started experiencing a lot of chronic type illness and um, I would pray and pray and nothing was nothing was changing and I was getting sicker. And um, and so, you know, I started being introduced to a lot of different healing modalities that were outside of prayer and it became really addictive to me. So I would try one thing and it would make me feel good. So I would do that for a little while and then that would lose its zest and then I would go to the next thing. So for me, it was actually illness, which I think the enemy put on me to distract me and get me off track and drag me in that direction. But for me, it was, I started getting addicted to these things. Um, it's like somebody will give you a reading or they'll tell you something and you start getting, it's like a drug and it's like you need the next hit of that spiritual thing because you're looking for something to like fill you, heal you, uh, give you answers. And I started finding it in that arena. So that's what drew me in. There is uh, a how about you? In the house. We got noise everywhere. But hey, okay, so basically what led me in uh, to the new age, you know, was the same kind of stuff that Joe is presenting at its conferences. Now, it wasn't, you know, the relationship between 
um, you know, thought, psychology, and, and biophysical health. It was the relationship between um, his, history and archaeology and uh, extraterrestrial life. So I was presented with, um, I mean, I came across evidence for what's called ancient astronaut theory, um, popular history channel television show called Ancient Aliens, um, where they present this idea that, you know, the Great Pyramid and Puma Punku and, you know, the Baghdad battery and um, these ancient hieroglyphs that apparently show a spaceship or a helicopter was evidence that ancient man had been visited by extraterrestrials who they mistook for being gods then built these religious systems around these people who are kind of like us. They're flesh and blood, and they just happen to live in another star system millions or billions of years more evolved than ours. And they came to give us a push along our evolutionary journey. And this is why you have this you know, big evolutionary gap where people are you know, drawing in caves and, you know, building rudimentary level tools to all of a sudden, you know, moving thousand pound ton rocks and building things right. that modern archaeology doesn't have an explanation for. You hear that all the time. And nobody knows and agrees upon how they could have done this. And you hear this, you see this evidence that seems crazy, um, you know, being able to move megalithic tone, uh, stones such as, you know, ones weighing 1,200 tons. Yeah, the um, ones in Russia are huge. Right. Doing things like, you know, building the Great Pyramid, which uh, is composed of, I mean, it, it, the lot, there's some spooky relationship between uh, geography and, and like the actual location of the pyramid and everything. It seems to be um, peculiar. So what they'll say is nobody has any explanation for this. It, it must be extraterrestrials. After all, some cultures tell us it was and so forth. Now, that's what brought me in. Um, I recently sat down with, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, his name's Dr. Michael Heiser. Yeah. Uh, yep. he, wrote, he wrote The Unseen Realm, and, and he, he addresses this stuff in his work from a uh, Christian perspective. And, and he's a PhD in uh, Hebrew studies and uh, ancient Semitic languages. So these, for the, these uh, Sumerian tablets that were discovered, that were translated by uh, Zechariah Sitchin, to Zechariah Sitchin translates these tablets. He has no degree in any relevant field of study. And he translates these tablets and says that what they're describing is this uh, alien race called the Anunnaki who came to our earth and seeded this new species to help um, mine gold and other materials to help replenish the atmosphere on their planet called Nibir Nibiru or something like this. Now, Michael Heiser can read Sumerian and 12 other dead ancient languages and he said he shows in videos none of these tablets mention anything like this. Sitchin is he wishes that he was someone like me who could actually read and translate this stuff, but he can't. And so I asked my friends in an interview, it'll be on my channel soon. I asked him, I was like, what about all this evidence presented in ancient aliens? And his answer was basically, what evidence? There's perfectly good answers to all of these questions in peer-reviewed journals and edited volumes that but nobody has access to them because they don't have memberships to academic resources like like jstor and they don't want to spend two hundred dollars on an edited volume of peer-reviewed studies and so because the information isn't mainstream released freely um it circulates within the academic community it's stuff you might be able to access if you were a, a university student for example and had access to an online library but he's like these ants these things have already been answered and dealt with and i don't know why they just don't listen it's like people don't go check to see if these things actually have answers so i was deceived by all this historical evidence by you know david hatcher childress not a historian not, not an archaeologist not an egyptologist david wilcock none of the above eric von Donakin, none of the above and then this giorgio whatever the guy with the hair I, I, no all <laughs> no three in any relevant field of study. None of them have any idea what they're talking about and they're just lying, right? I talked to Michael, Michael's like, this is just lying. They're just strip lying. So um, I, this is the kind of stuff that led me out of a Christian upbringing into the new age movement because it started with aliens and aliens gets into uh, contact material and everyone who believes ancient astronaut theory also happens to believe in new age philosophy and, and, and weird spiritual philosophy. But you were still um, studying the I mean, entity of Christ from a new age perspective, right? Like you're still reading books about him and thinking he was still oh, yeah. somehow tied into this. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I thought, you know, I thought he, he fit under the category of um, Eastern mysticism and that he taught Christ consciousness. So I believed 
the the mainstream interpretation uh, by people like Wayne Dyer or Eckhart Tolle or Deepak Chopra or Oprah Winfrey, for that matter, or pretty much anyone she has on her Super Soul Sunday. Um, I believe, you know, that he was someone who awoke into his own divinity and he was trying to teach us to do the same. And um, I thought that was a perfectly good explanation. But the point is, is that most people don't want to go and check to see if the things people like this are, are, are saying are actually true. Most people just don't. They'll, they'll hear it and then they'll, they'll incorporate it into their worldview somehow without actually checking it. Like mm -hmm. what, what experts say, what does Jesus himself say about himself? Right. What do historians say? What do scientists say? Why is it that there are only like three or four primary names that get circulated um, around the community talking about how the super string field has the property of consciousness and that consciousness is fundamental to the universe, but there's tens of thousands who are in disagreement with them who never get mentioned and brought up, right? So people see a PhD in the front of somebody's name and they make this appeal to authority and then they incorporate so it's the same thing with Joe, right? Nobody's going to question Joe um, if he lays down some, uh, you know, basic self-evident facts of biochemistry, and then he somehow links this into spirituality somehow, or mysticism somehow, because he's a PhD, he's a doctor. What mm -hmm. he's saying about biology is true, so we're going to assume what he's saying about spirituality is true, rather than thinking about these things. And does that really follow? Most of the things New Age teachers will say, they're non-sequiturs. Like, it does not follow from these premises that, therefore, uh, this spiritual truth exists. It just does not right. follow. Plus he, said, plus, he said he healed himself. So you have to understand yeah. that that appeals to the masses of desperate people who are thinking, well, he must have something special that I'm looking for because this guy healed himself of this whatever, whatever thing that he had. What what was it, like a spine thing? Yeah, it was like so, some some uh, spinal disease or degradation. Right, and that was part of, you know, that was part of my thing too. I mean, I had a little bit, I had a little bit of a different perspective because I actually believed that Jesus was the son of God. <laughs> And yet I think what we do is over the course of time, when, when we um, want something, when we want to sit in some sin or we want something to be true, we start to put a different face on God, which is really committing idolatry. Mm -hmm. And we start to put a different face on him to get him to um, be the God that accommodates whatever it is that we're doing. And so I believed he was the son of God, but I started to change my perception of who he was to accommodate the things that I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was see these healers. What I wanted to do was study this stuff. And I wanted, and I started, you know, once you start, you start getting into it deeper and these gifts start coming to your doorstep. Well, I want to do these things. And so we start changing God to make him fit into the things that we want to do. But the same thing happened to me where I was seeing these people, quote, healing people. They had these gifts and abilities. And so we just don't question anything because it's like, whatever they got, I need some of that. Yeah. And so we just throw logic out the window and we throw reasoning out the window um, because we're, we're enamored or we've turned that person into an idol. All right. Well, that's what, what I really think. Or whatever their ability is, we've turned yeah. their gifting into a, into an idol. And I think that's when when the Bible talks about many false Christs that will come out. Um, it may not necessarily mean you know people saying I am Christ, like a physical person walking around, but the idolatry that we say this person's Christ, but it's a false gospel. We've just right. molded him into what we want. Yes. And I guess that, that brings us to our second topic, and that's probably the most important part of this interview, because really it's it's about exposing Dr. Joe for what he is, but more more importantly, trying to warn Christians, because I've had subscribers email me that, that were aware that this interview was upcoming, and they said that they have people in their life that are looking into Dr. Joe, because I think he, he also peddles this thing that, yeah, you can be Christian and come in. Mm -hmm. That maybe, you know, you just don't have the full understanding of Christ. He was one, as Stephen said, that basically uh, enlightened himself or, or got to this state of divinity. And so there's that really slippery slope here. And yep. so we see this, especially both of you probably seen it with the New Age Christianity. I don't know if that's the actual term that they've adopted. But there's healings and tarot card readings. And you see, Stephen, have you seen that? Lee, I know you have. Well, there's, um, I mean, there is 
something called Christian mysticism, yeah. which is an oxymoron at the end of the day. Or And there's Christ, uh, Christopaganism, which is another oxymoron. But, you know, <laughs> it does exist. But yeah, there's, there's a really... Um... If you're not grounded in the word, you can slip into the new age and they'll, they'll yeah. welcome you and they'll actually, you know, put a different yeah. face upon what you uh, what you want. And um, we'll, we'll focus on the topic of healing. So I remember when I was talking with um, some of my subscribers who came out of the new age and they're baby Christians or new Christians. One of the ways that I thought that they could get, you know, rolled back into the new age, or maybe it's someone that wasn't in the new age at all, and they're still a baby Christian, and they could get sucked into the new age, is healing. And before we were actually broadcasting this interview, we were talking about, you know, the, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, healing being one of them, and what we all thought about them. So we'll talk a little bit about it. I think all of us agree that healings do take place in the current era, but it is definitely exploited by a lot of false teachers. We, we see that all over the place. And so we can, we can see how healing in the new age is exploited with true healing in the faith um, for, for true Christians. But I don't know, Stephen, do you have any uh, experiences with that or have your perspective on, on uh, healing and, and, and yeah. how it might be a slippery slope? Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, so I was actually in a conversation uh, with someone today in a coffee shop and um, we're actually reading the same book right now on uh, it's, a, it's basically how to live an emotionally healthy spirituality as a Christian. Um, now, they use a term called contemplative spirituality in the book, um, which we're supposed to live a contemplative life in terms of meditating on the word of God, refreshing ourselves and the promises of God and so forth. But the slippery slope is when, rather than try to get healed through prayer, through uh, asking God in faith, through renewing yourself with scripture, through worship, through taking authority over principalities and heavenly places, and so forth. Like, when Jesus, when Jesus walked around healing people, which he did all the time— People would come to him in faith. He would touch them, and they would be healed, or he would just say the word, and they would be healed, or he'd cast out a demon from them, and they'd be healed. But there's the slippery slope. Now, so there's contemplative spirituality in a general sense, which, I mean, we should we should live and be, you know, um, just, you know, self-aware as believers about what's going on inside of us and bring it to the Lord in prayer. But then there's also what is coined contemplative prayer, which is an actual type of prayer and this type of prayer aims to shift. It, it has nothing to do with nothing. It's a pure horizontal, yeah. no vertical connection. And it's about find a set of uh, verses that you find bring you peace and calm your soul. And you're just going to repeat them in your head over and over again. And if your thoughts get redirected, you're, you're going to come back to that verse over and over. And what you're going to do is you're going to try and like create a peaceful atmosphere in your mind. And that's the end of it. That's that's the goal, is to just create a new mental state for yourself. And then out of this mental state, you'll have you'll have clarity, you'll have you know healing. It's 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 essentially mindfulness repackaged. That's not how you're, that's not how you're supposed to pray. You're supposed to have a vertical relationship with God in communication. And yeah, wait on the Lord. If you're, if you're focusing on a connection with the Father and you're waiting on Him. And you're spending time in his presence, fellowshipping with him. That's one thing. But if you if you haven't even reached out to God yet, and you're just staying within the area of your own psychology, your only jo your only goal is to try and shift the brainwave state, to your state of awareness, and you're using scripture as a means to an end of some psychological goal. First of all, you're abusing the word. You're making an idol out of yourself and your own mind, rather than using prayer time to connect with God. And you're, you're practicing mindfulness. That's just mindfulness repackaged. And so out of this, if, if, if healing, whether it's emotional or psychological or physical, is coming as a result of contemplative prayer, um, that's just placebo at best, mindfulness at worst. Um, so obviously, now, obviously, there's a relationship between internal peace and uh, brain chemicals released during things like positive thinking, such as oxytocin and dopamine, 
and uh, other things which help stabilize our immune system and create homeostasis in the body so that our cells can refresh themselves and regenerate themselves and so forth. And, but and that's, that's like related to the power of persuasion too. And, and that relates to our prior conversation as well, like how people get roped into this. So I okay. think when you go to this conference, you get, you know, 999 other people around you that you start feeding off of. And I think as it relates to healing, right? Um, if you're in a room full of people and the energy is good, and as you as you mentioned, that it's just giving you that placebo effect that your your body is you know giving you euphoria. Um, yeah, the pain in your shoulder might go away, or you know whatever you know, small ailments uh, you might have start to start to fade away. You're not going to regrow a limb, <laughs> but but you're you're going to have a lot of these aches and pains, which a lot of these people that exploit healing. Um, they really only go over like, again, aches and pains. Um, that's why I've seen a lot of them do. And it's always, it's always spot healing. Like it has to happen right now. That's, that's one of the things that I've used in terms of my discernment is, and, and Lee, you could probably comment on this. Um, Lee, you have a chronic illness that you mentioned. I have a, a chronic undiagnosed illness. I would love to be healed, but I also know that, um, we don't always fully know God's will. This might actually be part of our testing, part of our trials. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the Apostle Paul thought when he was uh, in prison, you know, for a duration of time. That he had to he had to sit there and go through that test, go through that trial. And so, a lot of the people that exploit healing will say it has to be done now, and they'll pray over someone and say, "How are you feeling? How's that pain? Or can you see more clearly in your eye?" And they're like, eh, "A little bit." Well, let's pray again, and maybe a little bit better. Well, let's pray again. And I think you're trying to force God's hand in those types of circumstances. I don't Lee, what do you think about that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I was a practicing, um, like I would say, quote, quote unquote, healer uh, in the New Age and a Reiki master and things like that. And one of the interesting things that I started to notice uh, towards the end of my practice was that as the more I went on, the more heal <laughs> healings sessions that I did, the sicker I was getting. Um, and also the people that I would do sessions on, a lot of them would get a quote unquote healing. And then a year or months or something down the road, they'd have something much worse happen, whether it was mentally or physically. So it always seemed like something would take place in the moment that seemed good. It would almost like hook you in. I got to go back and get that again and again and again and again. And then they just, just something else would some more uh, like some worse sickness would come on them or they would start developing like paranoia, bipolar disorder, stuff like that. So it was the, the, a gateway. And, you know, I don't have all the answers, but what I what I think is possible is that because the enemy puts an infirmity onto someone that he can lift it off. He can lift it off in order to suck you in, to make you think you've been healed, to make you think you've had a healing when it's really just him trying to suck you into the whole situation. Um, you know, in terms of what you're saying, I, I've been to a lot of different types of churches, and I have seen, I have seen people get healed instantly in the moment. I have also seen people get healed over the course of years of waiting, you know, waiting for healing. Um, but I have to say this about healing. I do think healing can happen instantly. Obviously we see that, that yeah. happen with Jesus. But I do think that the part of healing that's not discussed enough is obedience. And I do think that deliverance is a result of obedience to God. And people are all looking for a quick fix. They want someone to heal them right away. They want to have whatever they want gone so that they can go on their merry way and live life the way they want to live it. And that's both in the church and in the new age, we see that. But not a lot of people want to sit and have the conversation about obedience and how when you, um, you know, close the door on sin and you turn from the willful sin in your life and you submit to Abba, that's when a lot of deliverance takes place. And in my own experience, some of the greatest deliverances and healings that I have had in my walk have been when I have come in areas of obedience. 
And so I just I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, that was even in, when Jesus healed people, some people just ran off and were like, I'm healed. You know, they 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 didn't really follow him afterwards. Right. And like you were saying before about how, you know, God may have reasonings for things. You know, I you know, sometimes I I do. I cry out to him like, you know, why haven't you know, why haven't you healed this yet? But I do think that there's also some element in our life um, of yearning for his return, of yearning for the that hour when we will be uh, met with our sinless self. And so if everything is all perfect and we have no adversity and no infirmity and no tribulation, what are we yearning for? So I think he allows some level. It's not that you have to walk around having a terrible day all the time, but I think he allows for some level of adversity so that our, our being is constantly yearning for him. Yep. Amen. I was going to say, uh, I think that if healing is done in the name of Jesus through the laying on of hands, I mean, even if it's a failed attempt, that's amazing. It's at least edifying to the person shows, hey, this person loves me enough and you know, I'm loved by God enough to have this Christian come pray over me. Um, I love watching people go lay hands on others. And, you know, these people, a lot of times they freak out and they'll start bawling. They can't believe um, what they just experienced. And uh, I think that's amazing. I think that's being obedient to the call of Jesus. And um, so there's a difference between praying praying over someone in Jesus' name unto the glory of God for a healing and trying to heal someone through an impartation of energy or mm-hmm. through a spirit guide or through the manipulation of your own psychology yeah. or your own biology some way. One is, you know, divination or borderline witchcraft. You're just doing witchcraft on your own on your own biology. Yes. You're trying to manipulate the matter in your own brain to try and create some kind of uh, outcome to please yourself and create pleasure in your own life rather than uh, submitting to the will of God and doing things through the agency of the Holy Spirit, which is totally biblical. So as far as like um, faith healings and so forth, I've, I've seen some in my own personal life where guys who were walking around my church with a walker for years, like over a decade after getting in a car accident, and then one service, he's walking down the church hallway perfectly upright, not wobbling anymore, doesn't need to use a wall or a walker. And he said, someone laid hands on me at a retreat recently, um, and God did a miracle, and I got healed. So obviously, God still works that way. And if it's if we're praying over people in Jesus' name, I think that's, that's amazing. That should be celebrated, especially when uh, fruit comes to pass. But um, if it has to do with... If, if the healing has absolutely anything to do um, with you doing anything other than being obedient to God and having faith in Jesus Christ, if you have to do something else, like rearrange your own mentality first or sit in silence for 30 minutes before or after or repeat some mantra to yourself or get into some kind of mood or atmosphere, um, then that's not the power of God. That at most is placebo or... Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, you, you, you are engaging in some level of sorcery and divination or witchcraft, and um, demons can produce signs and wonders. That's very clear in the Bible. So I, I wouldn't say, for example, Joe healing his back or whatever. Um, some of that might be placebo. Some of that might be Joe just fully turned him over or turned himself over to these quote-unquote um, entities that he talks about mm-hmm. And one of these entities was just like, he calculated, okay, here's a guy who's going to lead millions of people into hell. Right. If you just take this, maybe it was a demon giving him the back problem in, in, in the first place. Right. If we just yeah. lift up this person's back here and allow the body to heal itself naturally, he's going to be an amazing player for us in the new he'll age. He'll serve us. Yeah, he'll, he'll serve, serve us. Right. So I don't, you know. Until he's until he's useless, right? And then they'll just trash him. They'll just him. kill him off. And I think a good gauge, too, is like we were talking about idolatry. I think a good gauge for this, too, is if the healing or this experience, whatever people are doing, brings glory back to the person doing it. So whether that be in the New Age or in the church, if it's all about the person standing on the stage doing, you know, like, Benny uh, like Cirque du Soleil, and it's all about them and oh look at me and how many people i you know hit with my coat or how many people got got healed or whatever that's bringing glory back 
to the person, not to God. They are not decreasing in that chance, in that circumstance so that God can increase. Same thing with the new age. Like for myself, when I was doing those things, I was in essence putting myself as the mediator. I was putting myself in the position where only Yeshua belongs, where only Jesus belongs. Yeah, I'm taking the infirm. I well, this is what I thought I was doing. I thought I'm taking the infirmity off of other people, channeling it through my body, and then sending it back to God. Like that's my place, right? So you're putting yourself in the position where only He belongs. He, you know, and 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 it was bringing glory to me. And people were calling me from all different countries, wanting these. It's all brings glory back to the person, and we see it both in the New Age and in the Church. And so it's a really that, good gauge. Yeah. If it's bringing all glory to God, hallelujah. Yeah. If it's bringing glory to the person, something's wrong. And we see that the mediators everywhere, even in, so my testimony is coming out of Catholic Church. Catholic mm -hmm. Church is full of mediators, whether you pray to the saints, whether you go to a right. priest for confession. Um, same thing about the mantras, right? So you go to confession, you tell the priest all your dirty secrets, and he's like, 10 Hail Marys, five of our fathers, and suddenly you're healed just by that repetition. But yeah, right. that excellent points about mediators and, and who's really getting the glory and the healing. So e excellent, excellent points. And this this really dovetails into some of um, my subscribers' friends who were senior trainers with Dr. Joe. And Lee, you mentioned that as you get deeper and deeper into the occult healings, it just sort of backfired and you kept on getting sicker and sicker. And so... Actually, one of the senior trainers, and her name was um, Justine Demond. I'm just going to read this verbatim. Um, she's one of the senior trainers in Australia, along with this other one named Emma. And within the space of one year, two of them, or both of them died um, due to very odd circumstances. So Emma, she was a senior trainer, and... She was also a healer, and she had stage 4 lung cancer and died within 18 months, but managed to write a book about how to heal yourself. So, I mean, there's the, the oxymoron of it all. You know, you, you're saying, oh, the new age can heal you, but then, you know, you yourself die. And, they, and, then, and she seemed like she was in her 30s or 40s, right? Yeah, like they're both very young. young. Yeah. And, Stephen, I think you have uh, maybe something to say about who the new age targets regarding demographic of women and age. Maybe we'll get into that in just a second. Um, but Justine Damond, and if you Google search this, uh, Justine, D-A-M-O-N-D, she came, I don't know if she was here in the States for one of Dr. Joe's conferences or she was here for training of some sort, but she flew in from Australia. And while she was here, she was killed um, by a police officer. I don't know all the circumstances, but it was global news, nationwide news. I think the officer got indicted for murder. But again, just very weird circumstances. My subscriber who I talked to actually thinks that this is spiritual warfare, that this may in fact have been like some type of sacrifice. And um, I think that it really brings us back to the fact that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. These are spiritual warfare going on. And before you actually think about it in that terms, one of my old thoughts or my old thought processes was, you know, why, why would Satan want to kill people off? You know, why not try to keep people alive as long as they can so you can, you know, bring about this army of darkness? But that's only thinking about things from a fleshly perspective. Yeah, he wants to infiltrate people's mind like maybe Dr. Joe and keep him around for as long as he's good for just to deceive other people. But ultimately, he wants you to die lost. So when we see a lot of these Hollywood actors, um, especially a lot of the ones that just go crazy and shave their heads and they're washed out and then they, they end up suicided or um, death of some other means, um, he'll use you and abuse you until your time's up and he wants you to die lost. Um, so I don't know, maybe Lee or, or Steven, did you want to talk about um, sort of that fact about how, you know, this, this healing can actually lead to death and yeah. maybe maybe comment on how strange these two circumstances were with these ladies. Right. Um, I think one way that this is, is possible. It, so th some of the things that the new age movement will include into their healing modalities 
are things that the Bible explicitly calls demonic and would label as demonic. Um, and especially anything involving any kind of polytheistic entities or supernatural deities. Uh, the, the most direct scripture reference for that would probably be 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 20 to 22, where Paul says, I imply that what pagans offer unto idols, they're offering unto demons. And then he says, you can't sit at the table of demons and the table of the Lord. You can't drink, drink of the cup of devils and the cup of the Lord. And so what Paul is saying is that behind the idolatry of, of paganism, of Gnosticism, of Greco-Roman culture, there is a spiritual reality behind it. He says, I imply that they're offering these things. It's actually unto demons, right? So when people are trying to reach out to various idols, there's a spiritual power overseeing and behind these idols. Now, what happens when you, you step outside of the Father's protection and you fully yield yourself over to God knows what entity is actually on the other side of Raphael, the name Raphael, or you know when you call your spirit guide or Archangel Michael, or one of these ascended masters. The ascended master, they're all they're, it's all garbage. It's all pure demonic. If you actually read the ascended masters' teachings and stuff, it's all racist, pro-war, antichrist propaganda coming out of the mouths of these ascended masters. So when you get in contact with one of them and you're asking them to heal them. You're using their energies. You're channeling their energies to heal you. That's literally what they do. And uh, when you do this, is it possible that you're bringing more into your body than you expected, more into your soul and your spirit man than you expected? Um, in the New Age movement, there's uh, what are called um, astral parasites, which is just a euphemism for demonic possession. And there's also what's called, which they suck your life force energy or whatever and make you sick, make you ill. And um, people get this through practicing astral projection, but the principle carries over to any New Age practice. And a further proof of this is something called the Kundalini effect uh, or the Kundalini syndrome, which when people are practicing yoga, in particular uh, uh, Kundalini yoga, which more or less those same methods are being integrated into these healing services and uh, conferences of Joe, um, things like transcendental meditation and, and chanting and music and the calling on of entities and all these things. When people have what's called the Kundalini awakening, there's a lot of Hindu websites that warn people, you don't know what you're doing. Don't practice this. Tons. <clears throat> people who are trained yogic practitioners who are experts in this and have been doing this 30, 40 years, they're saying you will mess your life up. If you practice this stuff and you don't know what you're doing now, obviously they're all their lives already messed up and they can't see it, but they're explicitly warning people, you know, you're practicing Kundalini meditation. You want to have this Kundalini awakening. You want your pineal gland opened, get ready for things like headaches, nightmares. Mm -hmm. There's, there is a link between, um, psychosis and the practice of yoga, like actual psychotic delusions. And the practice of yoga is so strong that now psych, uh, psychologists are refusing to recommend yoga to their patients anymore. I, I mentioned that in a, in a study and in, in something I'm working on. Um, so it's, mainstream medicine recognizes the medical dangers of yoga. Yoga practitioners themselves recognize these dangers. Now, obviously, we would say you're, you're contracting demons. You're inviting them into your life. That's why you're having things like vomiting, back pain. Like new types of pains all over their body that weren't there before. Okay, confusion, um, vomiting, blurred vision. Okay, seizures. Okay, all of these. Some of these are symptoms of demonic possession in the Bible. The, some of them have these same symptoms, and Jesus cast a demon out of them, and they no longer have these symptoms. And people are have these are side effects of Kundalini awakening, and pineal gland opening. That people are going through in uh, New Age events like like Joe's conferences, or if you're if you're practicing transcendental, they tend, we talked to the uh, the person who was in, uh, involved in this, and she would say they would be met, they would wake up early in the morning, right? At Joe's conferences, they wake up early in the morning at a prime state where your brain wave uh, state is in between kind of dream and waking state, where you'll start meditating at three or four in the morning, and you'll go for five or six hours meditating. Right. It's not, it's, not, it's not a mystery to me why uh, people come out of here feeling psychotic, feeling uh, like off, 
wisdom traditions from Eastern mysticism and, and, and India, they're telling us you're going to feel off if you're messing around with this stuff. And it's well known within the New Age movement that this stuff is dangerous. Um, so, you know, par part of it might be that people are actually suiciding because they're going literally insane because they have demons in them now that are making them go in. He wants to see, kill, and destroy, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that 100 times out of 100, Satan will kill you before trying to prolong your life, right? If, if, he, if he can. Now, if he can't, then he's going to try and deceive you and give everything that you need to serve him if you're willing to serve him to create as much negative impact toward the kingdom of God as possible. But if he could kill everyone right now, then nobody would go to heaven and every right. image would yeah. be in hell tormented. So he wants to kill kill everybody. So if there's someone who is already weak psychologically or emotionally going to one of these events and they're calling on enemies, they're contracting demons, all of a sudden they get you know some type of cancer in their body and then they end up dying or suiciding in some mysterious way. Um, a, an explanation, you know, a spiritual slash natural, natural explanation, apart from any conspiracy, would just be they're literally getting demons or astral parasites from, you know, these symptoms of, of Kundalini awakening or whatever. They're just they're getting demons. They're getting sick and dying. The Bible, the Bible tells us people get sick and die from demons. Jesus, right. this guy, this one guy, you know, I think it's Mark 9, chapter 20, or sorry, verse 20, where uh, an epileptic. Um, walks up to Jesus and he starts foaming at the mouth and he, he, he falls into the fire and whatever. And Jesus commands a demon to leave him and he gets out of him. People get ep epilepsy and weird psychotic delusions and so forth from right. awakening. And people don't think it's demonic. Every, the Bible says it's demonic. So um, that's one explanation for these mysterious deaths surrounding some of Joe's clients. And people, it, we were talking about this with uh, our subscriber in the pre-talk. I mean, she was in a trance where she had her hand above her head and she was doing that for like five hours and Dr. Joe was telling her, oh, you you had some crazy thing going on there. And not being a New Ager myself, one of the things I had asked you all was, if I'm just a person that's rooted in science, right? So I'm a scientist, I'm just getting into this from maybe an enlightening point of view, you know, I think about how, oh, we've only used, what is it, like a small portion of our brain, three single digit percentage of our brain. Oh, I want to try to use more of it. But then there's some type of bridge between that enlightening from a spirit or a, a, a science perspective, and then you're channeling entities, you know. <laughs> and when we talked, it was about how it's it's a stepwise process. And as it relates to healing, so maybe, Lee, you could comment on this, where a false healing is not permanent, right? People would eventually, I mean, the people that you heal, they would get these symptoms back again, right? And would they come well, to they you would for, usually like, actually get different or new symptoms. But yeah, it's symptoms. not like, yeah, there was never would, would, like this perfect, healthy life and they ran off into the meadows. No. Right. But they come back to you again and they come back to you again. They come back right. and you see so you get deeper and then deeper and then deeper. Yep. And I think what Dr. Joe said, at least through her testimony, was then once you get deep enough, then you've you've come and you've bridged that science to spirituality and religion, then they start talking about the entities. And Lee, I think you've actually had circumstances with entities, right? Stephen, I don't know if you had, but maybe you both could talk about what that's like and, and obviously the dangers of it. Lee, did you, you want to go first? You want to start, brother? Or, or... Um, I, I mean, I've, I've had a demon pull me out of my body uh, twice. Pertaining to, to healing events, I haven't had any encounter with demons in that situation, but um, I've seen two, uh, at least what I believe to be demons. Um, and, you know, I had a friend who I was really, really close with at, at one time, and um, she wanted to go to this event. It was a New Age, like, kind of revival tent type thing where they were going to, you know, they're all meditating, they got sage, and they're going to call on the healing powers of Archangel Michael. And when they do this, they bring through the energies of Arch Archangel Michael. And because he has such intense energies, she ends up being on the floor, legitimately paralyzed, arms contorted, and cannot move, saying, help me, help me, help me. And they're, and they're saying, they're saying this is normal. This is just the energies of the sun and the dark. <laughs> it's just nobody really, panic. Yeah. You're just paralyzed. It's fine. Right. 
it's really, really intense, and, and you know, the people aren't used to it, but, you know, you'll get used to it, and your body, your body will accommodate, so, um, and before, before I turn it over, so, you know, what usually, ha so how do you get from this position of, you know, believing in things like scientific facts, like the placebo effect, and other types of what the New Age movement might call biohacking, which is rooted in some tr some truth, but gets into issues of idolatry and, and just um, selfishness and everything else. But apart from that, um, so how do you get from that to entities? They usually kind of slip it in the back door um, that the things that I'm teaching you now about the body and the brain, this is what the ancients knew. They'll, they'll speak vaguely about the ancients. Mm -hmm. They'd never define what culture or what primary text at, very rarely they'll say the ancients the wisdom of the ancients it's an echo chamber where nobody knows what they're actually talking about so this is what the the ancients all knew this stuff they all practiced this kind of healing but they actually received this material from from the gods right so this material what they did it was like the ancients so they understood these practices but they also understood the best way to incorporate these practices is to um, be in contact with with these supernatural beings and you know these supernatural beings are nothing extraordinary we hear about them all the time in the church growing up even they're called guardian angels you know everyone has a guardian angel so we just call on you know our guardian angels or some of these um uh what the bible might call watchers we'll call on them from other cultures because just like they help the other cultures they're still willing to help us right they help them evolve they help gave mm -hmm. them tools necessary for healing um you know so We'll just call on them, just like all these other ancient cultures did. It's not that big a deal. We're not we're not doing anything new or deviating from the norm here. You know, it's only in the last 50 years where scientific materialism has taken over, where this idea seems preposterous and abnormal. But you know, you go to India right now, they're all doing this. You know, a hundred years ago, when you know Theosophy was the dominant spiritual esoteric tradition in the West. They're doing this all the time. This is nothing new. It just seems off because it goes against the grain of your materialist conditioning that you've got in education. So they'll kind of like package it in. You've been conditioned and programmed to think this is weird when it's not. Every culture has been doing this since the beginning of history. And it's not that much different than what you were taught and raised with growing up in the church in terms of uh, guardian angels. You can call it spirit guides, too. There's not really a difference. Just call on them right now. We'll call out to actually some of the, the, the best entities from these um, old religions. Maybe we'll call on to Thoth, and we'll see what Thoth has for us today, okay? So now we're, and then so they, it, they make it seem really subtle and um, really digestible and acceptable. Um, or they'll tell you to just contact your own guardian angel or your own spirit guide. And um, so that's how a discussion about you know things like mind science or the placebo effect, they will tend to package it and... and say that you know this material was even was either given to us or known by the ancients and the ancients also brought alongside you know various entities and uh polytheistic gods and so forth and um this is really where we're going as a species is we're reuniting with these gods just like they did in ancient cultures um and then they'll use vague historical evidence and so forth like that of ancient astronaut theory to rationally ground this idea of, um, you know, polytheism, polytheism or extraterrestrials or so forth. So um, once again, a lot of vague evidences and non sequiturs where the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, they'll appeal to, you know, mainstream scientific jargon and then smuggle in the back door uh, various claims and principles about entities and so forth. Yeah. Lee, have you ever had any uh, possession or you know, demonic activity when you were doing your healings? Yeah, well, my my interest actually is interesting because he says his started with, you know, he was thinking of them as aliens. My interest was shamanism and the Native American culture. So I was looking at it from a perspective of the sky people and how these sky people would come through the portals. And actually one of the main portals is just a quick side note. One of the main portals where they would call on these sky people to come give them wisdom and, you know, quote unquote wisdom and, you know, healing modalities and stuff was uh, Mount Graham, which is where uh, the Vatican and NASA have the Lucifer telescope. Mm -hmm. That was one of their main locations. Um, but uh, anyway, so I was really into that. And that kind of 
you know, started getting me into the whole thing of uh, their their etchings on the walls in Peru and South America. And then then I started going where, you know, Steve was talking about, about the ancients and everything. So it always spirals. But yeah, as I got deeper into it and I allowed myself to uh, fall further, I started hearing more and more from these demons. And what I was thinking at the time was that they were um, my spirit guides, because all the people around me in the circles I was in was saying, oh, you're you're getting there. Like you have your spirit guides now and everything. And so the more I would talk to them, the more they talk back. Right. And I would I would uh, that that's how I would guide my sessions. The spirit guides would guide my sessions. And I would do that through means of kinesiology, through cards, through visualizations. Sometimes I would hear them, just all kinds of shenanigans. I would do automatic writing. I would, it's just, just crazy stuff. So I, um, yes, I had many conversations with these things. And, you know, like I said, towards the end of when I was, when the Lord was calling me, like he was really calling me. And these things were trying to kill me in every way, shape, form, and fashion that they could. It was bad. And he was calling me, and these things started getting angry. I thought these things were my bestest friends in the whole wide world. The Ascended Masters and the Spirit Guides, I thought we were, we were um, you know, buddies. And then as soon as the Lord was calling me back and I was starting to, like, have that struggle, all of a sudden, because I remember one day I was laying in my, laying in my bed, and I said, tell me who Jesus Christ of Nazareth is. And that's when things got ugly, like really, really quick. They got real upset. And I started having really extreme night terrors. And um, I got pushed down the stairs. I mean, like really crazy stuff. And so I, yes, I have, I have some experience, wow. but I mean, you know, I, I think it was, it was the, the Lord allowing that experience so that I could have the clear picture that these things are, you know, they manifest themselves in all different kinds of ways throughout history so that people, they deceive people in different ways, sky people, aliens, ancients, gods and goddesses, whatever the heck, you know, they, they deceive people in different cultures and things like that. It's the same, they're the same demonic entities just with different names, just like how the occult is the occult. It's the deception from the garden about becoming like God. Mm -hmm. Same thing, different wrapping paper in different cultures, different peoples, different nations. Put a new bow on it and hand it to someone and be like, here, here's, this is new age. You know, this is this, this is that. It's, it's the same serpent mm -hmm. um, doctrine. But it was good in the end. The Lord allowed you to be tested, but not more than you can bear. And now here you are having your testimony against it. And I forgot to include this, but you know, you guys have this huge ministry now. You guys got like over 40,000 subscribers and you guys have your Jim Carrey video, which got over a million dollar, or not a million dollar, but a million views. And the reason I bring that up is because um, my subscriber also sent me photographs of Jim Carrey with Dr. Joe Dispenza. So <laughs> again- That's not surprising. People it's have so talked about what's going on with Jim Carrey because he's sort of talking about Jesus and sort of talking about Christianity, but then he's got this whole new age thing. And then there you go. He's he's linked right in there with Dr. Mm -hmm. Joe. And so, you know, um, like you said before, birds of a feather flock together. You see these people start to congregate together. Yep. And in reference, you know, real quick to the whole thing about, you know, the kill, killing and, and uh, you know, taking people out and everything. You know, just like the, the girl that the subscriber that started this whole thing, you know, she's the only one of those three trainers that lived. Mm -hmm. Right. And the Lord, the Lord chose her. So he preserved her. And, uh, you know, I he, Satan tried to kill me many times. And, you know, it's it drives me to my knees in tears all the time because he chose me. He chose to keep me alive and he chose to preserve me. And that's that's he he's he's allowed to choose what he wants to choose but um you know if we step out from under that hand from under that hand of protection the spiritual realm is so real it's a free-for-all they can do absolutely anything they want to you you step out from under the authority of the most high and the protection of his word it's an absolute free-for-all so yeah. that's why it's so important to um wash your mind in the word of god all the time 
right. so that you're not easily deceived. Yeah, my last, that Interfaith Festival, that was, ugh, just, it was so oppressive, like such an oppressive feeling and atmosphere. Mm-hmm. But I was, I was glad I went hiking with my kids and we had a fun time in the woods and just, it, you know, it lifted off of me. But yeah, it, it's definitely oppressive if you, uh, you know, you're not grounded in the word and um, you step into those those conferences or those arenas. Right. But, um, I'm imagining that you noticed that were you the only one or you and the other believers that were there were the only ones feeling that heaviness? Like, did you notice everybody else there seemed like they were oh, having yeah. the best time ever? And, and I, I didn't say yeah. this in the video, but the, the very first thing that I noticed was pride, especially mm-hmm. with the parents that brought their children. So there was a try on a hijab station. There was try on a Sikh turban station. And <laughs> I'm just hearing the little whispers of all the parents. And you could just see them, you know, perking up their chest like, I am cultured. You know, look look at me. Look at what a good parent I am, exposing my ch- child to all these, these cultural things. And I just heard that throughout the whole thing. Everyone was just so proud of bringing their kids to this event. And everyone's happy. Everyone's talking about love and... Yeah, yeah. It... Look, look at my my daughter in, in a hijab, where all you can see is her pupils. <laughs> How good of a parent I am! Wow. Yeah. Here, here's a few more. I was just thinking. So here, here's a few more ways that that you know that they'll smuggle in entities to people who otherwise would have absolutely nothing to do with this. So they they tend to go um, more evidential. Mm-hmm. So. A way that I was deceived into this was through the work of uh, David Wilcock, and what he talked a lot about was um, the ability um, to eventually evolve to a state where you you kind of work your way up this scale of deification, or they're called uh, initiations in, in theosophy, where you're now operating, or they'll call them densities sometimes, like we're fourth density beings right now, but if we keep evolving psycho spiritually will be fifth density, sixth density and seventh density beings. And so, you know, they'll lay some kind of evidence for this version of the afterlife through, you know, sketchy near death experiences or past life regression therapy from people like Dr. Michael Newton or the uh, things like Dr. Ian Stevenson or Dr. Dr. Jim Tucker and, and reincarnate apparent reven- reincarnation evidence, all of which is garbage and I can address another time, but we can't on time. It's all trash. And so they'll use this to build a framework of the afterlife. And then they'll say, yep. the people that you're reaching out to, they're people like you and me. They're just outside of time and space, a little more evolved than we are. You're going to be with them on their level one day eventually as well. So you're just reaching out to fellow human beings who have upscaled this ladder of deification. And now we're just asking our fellow brothers and sisters for help. Now that seems very agreeable. Or they'll say this, or they'll, I mean, it's, all, it's a demon, obviously, but it seems agreeable when you lay evidentially that, that framework for that theory of the afterlife and say, we're just appealing to people more involved than us. That's all it is. Or they'll say, you're, you're gonna be, you can reach out to your higher self. And they'll say your higher, there's a bunch of different definitions of what a higher self is. But what they'll say is when you reach this level of, of spiritual involvement in the afterlife, in the next plane, what you end up doing is reaching a point where you are able to, um, you're outside of time, the dimension of time and the dimension of space. And you're now able to look at yourself from outside of time, but you're millions and millions of more years evolved than you are now, but you're able to see yourself on the timeline of the physical universe and you're able to watch your own life and you're now able to help yourself from the future, right? So now you can ask your higher self, who is you, who is you 300, 400 million years (laughs) advancement in another plane, ask your higher self, your future self for contact. Say you want to talk to him, you know, because have you ever seen the ending of uh, interstellar? Yes. Yeah. You know, in Delaware, he's in this dimension. It's actually him trying right. to talk to himself. It's kind of like that. Just ask your higher. So those are two ways where they'll they'll package it behind you know pseudoscience and 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 whatever, and they make it seem very agreeable when they tie it into this theory of the afterlife, which the Bible can be, the Bible refutes all those theories in the afterlife in in one single verse, Hebrews nine twenty seven. It's been appointed unto man, each man to live once, and then after that face the judgment. So. Yeah. 
So yeah, I, I just got uh, just one final thought, and then maybe each of you could give a quick final thought as well. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And I've always just thought it's interesting if you look at Hollywood or the musicians and everything, you just see that you lead a more sinful life. They tend to generally die quicker, whether it's from alcoholism or drugs or sexual related diseases and such. And then what we've seen through this, the New Age movement, which is sin, um, you have people being oppressed um, emotionally, spiritually, physically. You know, you, Lee, you said you do these healings and then another ailment will come by and then plus with the senior trainers of dr joe dispenza um, there's four of them total two of them have already died one was saved by jesus christ and is still alive and so there's one left i think in in maybe the australia region um but yeah i just i would just recommend everyone to stay away if you have any questions definitely write them in the youtube description box and we'll try to answer them but uh maybe both of you closing word as well no, I just real quick from from this perspective of Christians falling into this stuff, I just wanted to touch on that two seconds because, you know, I know like um, the subscriber that contacted you said that a lot of Christians were showing up to his conferences and, you know, they would ask her, you know, do you think this is OK? Do you think this is in line with, you know, my Christian faith? And she would just not know what to say. So she would say, I don't know, I guess so. Um, and, you know, we see the church or parts of the church in the new age blending like more now than than ever and i think part of it is that people are being desensitized to the new age mm -hmm. and they're not even seeing it as new age anymore so i think that mainstream culture is actually making so many of these things just like normal everyday things like yoga yeah. i mean it's like an ice cream truck on every corner it's like here's your ice pop and let's do some yoga i mean it's like it's such a pop culture thing. Right. I mean, churches are having yoga classes because it's like the thing that the moms want to do, drop off my kid at VBS, put on my yoga pants and go do my yoga. And it's like, and then they'll play praise songs in the background. It's like, what in the world is Don't happening yoga. right now? <laughs> it's cr It's just insane. But it's like, we've, we've made a lot of the occultic stuff normalized it's pop culture and so christians are like maybe it's okay maybe it's not okay and the, and the problem is that when we're not in a fully surrendered life in a fully mm -hmm. surrendered walk mm -hmm. when we're not when we're not picking up our cross every day to bear it when we're not in the word every day we're not connecting with the father every day we're not mm -hmm. washing our we're not washing our minds we're not asking him to renew our spirit the church, when we're not crying out and saying, search my heart, oh God, see if there's any wicked thing in me. We're not praying for conviction. We're not praying for correction. What happens is we're, we're uh, simmering down into a lukewarm state and then you are, you are fair game for deception. See, when you're, when you're on fire like that, those things are gonna whisper in your ear and you're gonna say, get behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. I serve, serve the Lord my God alone. Right. But when you are in that lukewarm state and you're getting fed by the media, you're getting fed by the culture, you're getting fed by all of these things, and your church is feeding you lukewarm garbage, yep. you're you're gonna those lies come into your ears, and because your mind is not washed with the word, you're gonna start to entertain things, and then your friend is like, "Hey, Susie, whatever, Bill, you want to go to this conference? <laughs> this Joe guy." It's all these cool things about your mind. Maybe my back will get healed, whatever. And then you go with Susie, and next thing you know, someone's going like this over your head for five hours. So, you know, I just it's, this is just like my cry to the body of Christ. Like, this is not an hour to be, like, sitting on, you know, our behinds, like, doing whatever we want, and one toe in the world and one toe in our walk. It's just not the hour for that. And uh, I just I just pray that um, everybody watching would have an ear to hear and that they would surrender areas of their life where they haven't surrendered. Amen, sister. Like the Bible says, that was actually, the Bible says that, you know, the word of God is for uh, correction and training in righteousness and for reproof. And, and the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. He's the spirit who convicts us of sin and righteousness, who leads us into all truth who reveals and bears witness to Christ. This is the spirit where the Bible says we have an anointing such that we need no man to teach us. 
This is the, the spirit who reveals to us and alarms us or alarms our spirit when something is off theologically, when our, we have like this spiritual sense, it's like, uh, that's just not right. Might not be able to identify it with a certain, you know, theological distinctive of theirs, but I can, so I can sense something in my spirit, the Holy Spirit is telling me no, right? But if you have willful sin in your heart, you're implicitly quenching the Holy Spirit just by you existing mm -hmm. in that state. You're grieving the Holy Spirit, which from my relationship with God um, means that you simply have less of the presence and power of God within you. And when you have less of the presence of God within you, you have less of the discernment of God within you because discernment comes from his presence. You're able to sense what it is and what isn't him. And obviously you compare it to the word, but if you're not in the word either, you have nothing to test it against. If you don't have your word hidden in his heart that you may not sin against him, then when something comes your way, your only, your only method to navigate it is to bounce it off your own, the way that seems right to a man. Unless you're filled with the spirit and you're walking um, in the wisdom and you have a solid understanding of scripture, which we have a moral obligation from God, and then you're able to test these things and sniff them out. And then you can be like, hmm, that method of contemplative prayer that doesn't seem to agree with, that doesn't, that doesn't bear witness with me, and I don't see it in the word of God. But if you don't know what the word of God says, and you've disturbed the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, then you have neither. And now you're, um, you're a walking target for deception, and you're going to offer it in your own flesh, and you're going to lean on your own understanding because you don't know what the ways of the Lord are. So that's a problem. Now, I want to I wanna close with something about, um, so check this out. Okay. <clears throat> we are built to, uh, like, our, our physical bodies are built to detect when something is wrong. So if I were to stick my hand in this fan right beside me, it would hurt real bad. This is, it has metal blades. It's like an industrial flat fan. That would really hurt, right? If I feel something off in my heart, like a pinching, a wincing, there's something wrong with my organ. My body has been built by God to tell me something is not right here with your physical body. You know, I'm letting my brain know, hey, this could kill you. This could impact your ability to survive and be healthy and raise children. Um, so get this checked out, right? Now, we often don't consider <clears throat> that God has built us to bear his image, which means that we're psychological beings. And we're also emotional beings, as God is. And when something's off in our psychology, in our in our mental world, and in our in our emotional health, that is supposed to be an alarm system to, to us to say, hey, you know, I need to check this out. I need to reflect on my life. Am I being an integrity? Have I forgiven people? Am I acting maturely here? Is there a way that I know I can act in, in a more loving way? Am I being authentic to how I actually feel and think in this moment? And we're supposed to bring these things to God and ask him to reveal these things to us, pair them with scripture and so forth. But here's what the New Age movement does. So people, here's what they do. It's garbage. So what they do, so they'll, they'll live a life of self-indulgence, essentially. So sometimes in open relationships, that's very common in the New Age movement, so I'm just going to use an example where um, it's like the average sinner type relationship where he's in a relationship with an individual and um, he kind of commits adultery on her in his heart when he, he looks at other women, lusts at them, thinks that's ah, just a guy thing, you know, looks at a woman, walk by, checks her out. He's, he's broken connection with her in his heart 30, 50, 500 times over during the course of the relationship. By, maybe he watches porn, very popular uh, thing in the New Age movement. Sexual promiscuity is actually encouraged in, as an expression as an expression of, of freedom um, in the New Age movement. So maybe he's cheating on her. Maybe he's something is wrong. He's he's doing something the Bible condemns as spiritual adultery. He's committing adultery with with other women in his heart. Now, because we're built by God to operate within His commandments, when we're not operating within His commandments, our conscience often will tell us you're doing something wrong. You can't be doing this anymore. Our emotional health will be trash because we're operating against the design of God. And our, our thought life will also be completely scattered because now we're trying to have a relationship with this woman, but there's no intimacy because there's lies and deception and adultery in between us. So that's just one example of how a person can enter into a state of compression, or sorry, depression and self-confusion and anxiety. And now they have this anxiety and this depression and they have a, a garbage in, internal emotional world where they're constantly flustered and they don't know why 
and then they go to a, a Joe Dispenza or whatever his name is, and they'll go to one of his events, and, and Joe's going to teach you now how to be um, a lying, stealing, uh, blaspheming, uh, disobedient to parent, uh, mas masturbating, fornicating, uh, drunken adulterer. He's going to show you how to be those things, but how to hack your biology so your conscience doesn't convict you of your sin before a holy God, and, that, and, and your own flesh doesn't convict you for operating against the design of God, which you know better because his, his commandments are written in, in your heart. So now what you're going to do is you're going to do things like meditate. We're going to use positive affirmation and mantras, and we're going to spend three hours a day where you're literally training yourself not to think about anything, to block out all voices, including the voice of your own conscience. And when you're in this state, your body naturally is going to produce more of these chemicals that are intended to make you happy and will eventually lead to you having a greater sense of physical health because you have more serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin in your system. Look at all these studies showing a link between the chemicals produced through positive thinking and meditation and physical health. But the point is, is that a lot of these people go to these conferences, 0% of the people at these conferences have perfect emotional health and perfect psychological health. They are a wreck. They are a broken vessel, just like a lot of us still are in Christ. I need I need him every single day. I'm a wreck without him. If I'm not praying in the word every day, I can't, I'm not like you guys. I can't function normally unless I have the Lord in my life, divine intervention every single day. I need him. People don't have Christ. They don't have the wisdom of God. They're sinning constantly against themselves, their own body, other people, and they need a way out. And so none of these people lining up are like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm doing so perfect. I just want to get even more perfect. They're depressed. They have anxiety. Like millions of other people do. And mo the vast majority of the population, everyone has something wrong with them. And they're going there and they're trying to fix this problem. And they're trying to fix this problem by altering their brain chemistry so that they feel better. Rather than allowing their emotional system and mental system to... Uh, tell them something is wrong with the way you're living your life rather than do that they create a worldview to justify that and then they medicate and um put a bandage over the symptoms of living in in constant sin through meditation through mindfulness through training yourself to not listen to any voice or form that passes through your mind even if it's the voice of god even if it's the draw of the holy spirit no that's just another form in my energy field even your own conscience, you get used to snuffing the voice out of your own conscience. So basically, people are depressed, they have anxiety, sickness, illness. How many know that depression and, Ill and anxiety can cause physical illness in your body, destroy your immune system, and cause you to be sick all the time? And how many know that depression and anxiety are caused by living in sin and living in destructive lifestyle and behavior? But rather than fixing their lifestyle and saying, no, I'm not going to do those things. Those things don't feel right. They don't agree with the word of God. They're going to forsake the commandments of God and try and hack their biology to supplement how awful they feel inside because they aren't living in alignment with the will of God. Mm. So it, 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 this whole thing of trying to shift your biology through meditation and create new chemicals flowing through your brains that we're going to put we're going to put things on you to measure brain weight <laughs> and maybe blood levels to measure the the oxytocin now in your blood and everything like that notice what happens when they're not doing any of these things for a month they're back to being absolutely depressed and suicidal yep. right and that's because you're, when you're not constantly f flooding your body with mm -hmm. a false manufactured source of love and happiness that is fabricated and created in your own mind and you allow your own your own heart and your own conscience to bear witness to who you are and what you're doing you're de you realize I'm, I'm depressed i'm broken i'm living in sin i can't do this now if we did not meditate and train people to meditate and to suppress these feelings we'd have more people coming to christ because they'd, they'd recognize their own brokenness and their conscience would start convicting them of their sin to, uh, regarding one another and, and before a yeah. holy god they're suppressing all these voices, and they're suppressing all of the consequences and side effects of these choices by retraining their biology through meditation and positive thinking to produce chemicals um, without there actually being proper stimuli in place. Those chemicals aren't bad. God designed us to, our bodies to produce those chemicals when we're in right relationship with people, with ourselves, and with him. 
But when you're training your mind to create them out of thin air through fantasy, think about something that makes you happy. Tell yourself over and over, it's going to be okay. It's, the universe loves me. It's going to be okay. You're creating them out of thin air, and you're giving yourself a false assumption that everything in your life is okay just because you have something flowing through your bloodstream for a couple hours. Amen, bro. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so good. But, Ditto. Man. So um, if you don't know about Stephen or you don't know about Lee, Lee and James at Philly Ministries, I've got links to both of those channels in the YouTube description box. So please do subscribe to both of their channels. Excellent content. Um, you are both my brother and sister in Christ. I love you both. This was a great session. And I truly, truly hope that you know this brings people out of the new age or if there's Christians that are starting to get into that lukewarm territory that this is like a a wake up call like yeah you know, just don't even don't even uh, sit at this table but uh, it's uh, it's been a pleasure do you, do you have anything else to say uh, before we close just real quick I was just gonna say if they, if they want good information if anybody they know is like teetering with the new age like steve's website has a lot of really good information and reasons for jesus i'll put that in the youtube description box as well yeah it's got really good 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 you know stuff for them to send to other people it's really well well put yeah i would just say to subscribe to everyone who's in this video because we're all doing the same thing just from a slightly different angle yeah so yeah, it's been a pleasure yeah likewise well, god bless everyone and thanks for tuning in see ya shalom